Hello. Uh, first of all, thank to everyone who came here today for our talk, If Gaudi Had a Cluster. We feel honored that the fantastic organizers of Strange Loop um, invited us to speak here today, alongside all these other great creative thinkers. Uh, in fact, I'm kind of surprised there is anyone in this room with this, all these talks happening in the other ones. Uh, I would want to be there, not here, but like that's me. Yeah, thanks for coming. Uh, yeah, thanks for coming. And uh, last year, after we attended Strange Loop, uh, I couldn't stop talking about it for a month. It's a really special conference, and uh, it's full of really amazing people. And I want to thank both the organizers and uh, everyone who is visiting this conference. It's great to talk to all of you guys. Yeah. Cool, so we're here today to talk architecture, both um, software architecture and building architecture, um, plus clusters and programming languages, and hopefully have a little fun in the process. So the premise of this talk is, um, what if Antony Gaudi, the Spanish architect um, whose work pretty much defines the Barcelona cityscape, what if he lived 100 years later than he did? What if he had access to you know, the massive amounts of computing power that we kind of take for granted today? So how would his architectural practice, which is you know, arguably some of the most creative in human history, you know, how would it have changed? Uh, but first, you might be wondering uh, who those people and why do they care so much about architecture? Uh, my name is Max Grigorev. Uh, I am a distributed systems engineer, and I used to build large systems for Yahoo, Google, Airbnb, and then I joined Flux to build the tools we're going to be discussing here today. Yeah, so my name is Jen Carlyle, and I'm a co-founder and engineering lead at Flux, and Flux is a startup in San Francisco, and we're building an open platform for the architecture, engineering, and construction industry. So, you know, we're a mixture of software engineers and designers and architects and structural engineers and more, um, and we think that technology and the smart use of data can really dramatically improve how we design and build buildings. Um, so as part of the Flux platform, we've um, built a graphical web-based programming language aimed at architects and engineers. And you know, with this web-based programming language, it basically offloads the heavy computation from a user's machine and up into the cloud where we can you know, spin up resources on demand. Um, so later, we're going to talk about our approach to designing and building this programming language you know, and what we learned from it, kind of the good, the bad, and the ugly, and everything in between. Um, but first, we're going to talk about a little bit about Gaudi, the man. Um, then we're going to cover a brief history of modeling and architecture. Um, then we have a few demos to kind of spark your imagination around the question, like, what if Gaudi had a cluster? Um, and then we're going to switch gears and talk about the uh, language we developed, the system architecture, our approach, kind of the frameworks we chose, and why, um, and what we learned in the process. So this is Anthony Gaudi. Uh, he was born in 1852 in a family of Copperth Mess uh, in a small town just 70 miles outside Barcelona. Uh, he, uh, he spent much of his early years in the family's Copperth Mess workshop. And if, as a coppersmith, you constantly have to think specially. Is the surface of this bank consistent throughout? Uh, what is the volume of the spot? Examining things like that, um, uh, helped him develop uh, a great ability to think specially. And uh, compared to the uh, other architects who were mostly using uh, 2D representations like drawings, uh, his thinking was firmly rooted in 3D space. Yeah, and for any of you who are curious, this is called an alembic. Um, and this is for distilling liquids. And it's just one example of you know, something that Gaudi might have built in his family's workshop. Right, so Gaudi arrived in Barcelona when he was just 17, and four years later, he became an architecture student. Graduating uh, after six years of studying, uh, he uh, placed himself and uh, gained a strong reputation uh, in the Barcelona architecture scene. Uh, in the early 1880s, uh, he became an assistant to an architect, uh, Francesc de Paula Villar, uh, who was commissioned to build uh, La Sagrada Familia. Uh, the luck with the project in 8083, after this agreement was a group commissioning the church. Um, and uh, slowly but surely, um, Gaudi took over the project. Uh, at first, he stayed true to the original plans, but then he, uh, little by little, uh, adding a little bit elements here and here and there, um, he changed the project to be in his own unique organic style. 
Yeah, so Gaudi worked on La Sagrada Familia for 43 years from 1883 until his death in uh, 1926. So like, just imagine that like, you start working on a project when you're 31, and then for the next 43 years, you devote like, your entire being to that project. You know, every waking thought, your creativity, your energy, um, it's really pretty remarkable. Um, Towards the end of his life, Gaudi decided to decline all other professional projects, and he devoted himself to creating plaster models and sketches and drawings of Sagrada Familia so that work could continue after his death. So he actually predicted that the project would take about 200 years to complete, which like when I think about that, my mind kind of explodes. Like we train ourselves to think about, like, when am I going to get done this week or this month or this quarter? Um, you know, imagining a project that goes on for 200 years is pretty mind-blowing. Just for fun, um, here's a picture of the Sagrada Familia building site in Barcelona, complete with goats. I hear goats are the new cats. Um, so this is probably like circa early 1900s, so pretty different than the, than the Barcelona that we know today. Um, but before we move on, I want to sprinkle in a brief mathematical interlude and talk to you about a fascinating thing called catenary curves. Um, so catenary curves are all around us, kind of like the dip of a power line between towers, like a necklace, um, a spider's thread, or a clothesline. If I pick up this chain, this is actually, I'm now holding a catenary curve in my hand. Um, you know, and being in St. Louis, we can't forget about the gateway arch. This is a really beautiful example of an inverted catenary arch. Um, so a catenary curve is, um, you can think of it as the average of pure exponential growth and pure exponential decay and can be represented with this formula here. Um, when the scalar A equals 1, you get this, um, you know, nice, very beautiful kind of curve here in black. Uh, the cool thing about the catenary curves can be demonstrated with this chain. When it hangs, the links settle in a position where all the uh, tension forces act alongside the line of the, uh, this, this arc, right? Uh, when inverted, um, the forces of tension become the forces of compression, and uh, those forces also act alongside the line. This is, makes it the perfect shape for a freestanding arch because uh, the forces are so strong supporting it that you don't need any outside support, uh, like uh, bracing or buttresses. Um, if you build a cantonary arch out of the bricks, the forces are so great that you don't need any mortar to hold it. It's just going to hold itself under its own weight. That's pretty cool construction, I think. And uh, we bring this up because uh, Gaudi used cantonary curves all over, uh, all over his projects. Specifically in Sagrada Familia, all the towers are cantonary, uh, cant cantonary in shape. Before uh, Gaudi, uh, cantonary arches were used in like bridges, but no one uh, tried to use them in uh, normal architecture. Yeah. <clears throat> so um, there is one other interesting, if kind of less common, use of catenary curves in the built environment. So if you actually build a set of catenary humps, you can ride a square-wheeled bicycle over them. <laughs> this is a mathematician. His name's Stan Wagon. This is the late 90s. And so as long as the side of the square is the same length as the arc of the, of the catenary hump, you can take this kind of ridiculous device and you know, pro propel yourself down the road, which is pretty fun. So I want to switch gears a little bit and um, talk a bit about the use of models in architecture, both physical and digital. So when you think of building design, you probably think of, you know, like um, blueprints and drawings and two other two-dimensional representations. But, you know, many architects want something more, something more physical or spatial where you don't have to use your imagination as much to kind of get a sense of what a building will look like or feel like when it's complete. So um, this is when they turn to models, physical models models. Um, physical models have been used for hundreds of years and for you know, all sorts of different reasons in architecture. So a model might be used to explain um, a complicated design or to you know, show the interaction of two volumes. It might be used to like, get buy-in from a client or just like, uh, explain a complicated design idea. So um, um, with models, 
and or sorry, with architecture, you know, you can think of it, architecture is really about creating spaces. And when you only have 2D representations, you really have to like use your imagination to think of what that space is going to feel like. But if you use 3D models, it's a lot easier to get everybody kind of on the same page and imagining the same space. Right, and the past couple of decades, um, the architecture profession is turning more and more to virtual models. And of course, they're fast to iterate, easy to visualize, and lower overhead than physical ones. Uh, some brief people are even turning to virtual reality to communicate their designs. Uh, now we're going to uh, share some particularly interesting models with you guys. Okay. <clears throat> so this first one, this is Eero Saarinen, and this is a model of the TWA terminal at JFK Airport. So um, it was commissioned by Transworld Airlines in 1955 and then opened its doors in 1962, and it's actually part of JetBlue's JFK operation. So if we have any like New Yorkers in the audience, you might have actually been to this terminal. So. Um, the exterior of the building is this concrete roof that's meant to like emulate a, a gigantic bird in flight, and the inside's really beautiful. You have this kind of continuous ribbon where the, the ceiling kind of flows into the walls, and those walls f uh, flow into the floors. And Saarinen used models to answer all sorts of questions. Um, he mostly built his models out of things like cardboard and wire and a little bit of wood. Um, but he'd use them to answer questions like, how should the roof be shaped, or how are people going to circulate within this space, or just like, what's it going to feel like inside um, through this picture and just for fun um, he's like really diving into his model <laughs> love it um, just a fun side note, if we have any like furniture geeks in the audience, you might know Saarinen for his mid-century modern furniture design. So um, he's known, uh, he's the creator of kind of the ubiquitous tulip table and tulip chairs, and one of my favorites here, the womb chair, it's like great for hours of napping. Right, and typically uh, physical models are made of things like cardboard, plaster, uh, wood, wire, but sometimes more ephemeral, uh, more transient materials are used. Uh, so this is an example of Fry Otto, a uh, German architect. He was active after the Second World War, and uh, during that time there was a lack of construction materials um, around Europe, and um, he used uh, properties of soap bubble to generate the enclosures with the maximum volume and minimum surface uh, space. So he he would actually use the properties of uh, the bubble itself to kind of compute, I guess, the shape of the building. Yeah. Um, shifting to somebody more contemporary, I'm guessing most of you have heard of Frank Gehry. Maybe raise your hand if you've heard of him. He's a pretty famous, like, star architect, yeah. Um, so he has a really interesting practice that marries the physical and the digital. So he actually iterates his designs using physical models like this one. Um, and then when he's satisfied, he uses this device called a faro arm, which is basically a portable measurement arm. So you, with this, you can basically reverse engineer a physical model and create a digital representation from it. So once um, he's, you know, they've created a digital representation, other folks in the building trade will work off that. So like structural engineers and mechanical engineers. and um, um, he has a pretty unusual practice, like Max mentioned before. Most people start with digital because it's like a lot easier to make changes and a lot faster to iterate. Um, but you know, we're not going to tell Frank Gehry how to do his job. And of course, we cannot forget about Gaudi. Uh, his modeling process from more than a hundred years ago is still pretty awe-inspiring and amazing. Uh, of course, he used the wood and the wire and the plaster and all of those materials, but the most famous of his models is actually the chain model of La Sagrada Familia. He would take the links of chain, hand them from the ceiling, and then add uh, little bags filled with, uh, uh, like, teeny lead weights in them, uh, which would control the shape of those cantonary curves that we know of. Um, that, that's pretty mind-boggling, yeah, right? Yeah, I mean, just think about this process. You're like hanging chain after chain from the ceiling. You want to change it a little bit. You have to like remove a few links from the chain, or you take a few weights out of a bag that you've tied there. It's just like very painstaking and time-consuming. And you know, this this model here is actually what kind of uh, inspired us and led us to the question, like, so what if Gaudi had a cluster? 
Um, so for fun, um, a few of us at Flux built an app on the Flux platform to explore this question. So the first question we asked was like, what if Gaudi could uh, build a parameterized model of Sagrada Familia and explore, you know, a hundred or a thousand design iterations in the time it would take him to do one using his manual processes? So we're going to start a video here. Um, so what you're going to see is a parameterized model of Sagrada Familia. We have some so we can see what we're starting with. Um, we can change things like the number of bell towers, change it from three to four, and then in just a couple of seconds, we get our new model. We can change the dimensions of the floor plate. We can kind of stretch it out a little bit. And there we go, in another couple seconds. Um, we can do things like change the height of the main tower. Zoom out to see the results, and then you know our old friend, the catenary. We can change the a scalar parameter to um, change the shape of the curve. You know, this is a lot easier than like changing, you know, taking chain links out. Um, we can also do things like change the height. So like you know, every single one of those iterations was like a couple of seconds, and you know, you can just imagine how much time that would have taken him um, back when he was building his physical models. So um, another area that piqued our imaginations is biomimicry. So biomimicry is when we imitate nature to solve um, kind of complex human problems. So Gaudi was a deep um, lover of nature, particularly uh, naturally uh, occurring geometric forms. And you know, if you look at his buildings, they just like scream organic at you. Um, and if you look closely, you can see how he applied kind of naturally occurring motifs to his designs. So one example is, um, on some of the columns in the external facade, the base of them are what's called, it's kind of a mouthful, I sometimes mess it up, called um, hyperbolic paraboloids. Um, and it's actually the same shape that you find at the base of, this is a Kapok tree here. So um, also just kind of fun fact, if you take the webbing between your thumb and your forefinger, this is also a hyperbolic paraboloid. <laughs> um, so I think this quote kind of sums up his attitude pretty well. You know, Gaudi was a deeply religious man, and he found um, nature to be very spiritual. So besides studying trees, he studied things like crystals and um, like falling seed pods and um, cereal grains like wheat and native grasses when he was designing Sagrada Familia. Um, so we uh, um, wanted to add this into our demo, our demo as well. So in this application, or Start the video. Oh. Oops. You do it. Okay. okay. So in um, in this video, we're looking at the ornamentation on the tops of the bell towers, and we start with a crystal form, but you can very easily change out to a different motif. So now it's stalks of wheat at the top, um, and then you can change it, and now it's nautilus shells as ornamentation, or now we can tr change it into a tuft of grass. And besides changing motifs, we can actually change the parameters so we can make it less compact, so it kind of bows out, or we can make it much larger, you know, or we can make it more dense, so kind of add more blades of grass. So I think now we can kind of look at the results and <laughs> pretty fun. And then um, finally, we asked ourselves, you know, with his deep interest in kind of organic form and nature, would Gaudi have been fascinated with the idea of um, genetic algorithms? So what if he let, you know, a thousand generations of Sagrada Familias kind of grow and mutate and swap DNA? Like, what if he let them evolve? So um, we built just that. In this interface, um, you can launch a genetic algorithm, and it launches a 1,000 generations. Each generation has 50 candidates in it, so we're generating 50,000 different um, churches, basically. And then we run each, um, each model through a fitness function, and then whatever model has the highest score of that fitness function, we deem it the winner. So you want to start it? Oops. <coughs> so you can uh, check out what we're starting with. And then we can launch the algorithm. And it's all running in the browser. Um, we get our, 
our, our best candidate out of the 50,000. We can load it and check it out what it looks like. Eh, it doesn't look too different. Let's run it again. Um, this time we've got one with just four bell towers. We can load it. Um, see how it looks. Yeah, it's cool. Um, so we had a lot of fun building these demos. I hope they kind of spark your imagination around the question, you know, what if Gaudi had a cluster? Um, yeah, so imagine Gaudi now has his cluster, and now he has to tell it what to do. So he needs a programming language, but what kind of language would Gaudi want? Haskell, of course. <laughs> Maybe Go? I think he might like Perl. <laughs> All right, uh, let's be serious here for a second. We are not going to tell you, we'll give you a huge lecture on how to design a programming language. Uh, there are, a lot of people are doing that here, a lot of people can do that here, and we don't even have enough facial hair among the two of us to, to do that. Uh, what we can do instead is pander to our imaginary client, Mr. Gaudi. Yeah, so first of all, Gaudi was a very you know, visual thinker, so we think he'd prefer visual tools over something text-based. You know, architecture is full of sketches and models, um, you know, formulas and text too, but uh, you know, we think that something visual is preferable to something symbolic. Um, second, we think that the language and environment must have um, you know, a means for easy reuse, like the same way um, a software engineer doesn't want to like write um, basic data structures and sorting algorithms every time she like writes code. Um, Gaudi doesn't want to start from scratch every time he begins a new project. And you know, if he had a good over idea over here, he might want to reuse it over here. Or if he was inspired by the work of you know some of his contemporaries, maybe he'd want to take that idea, kind of remix it, and then use it in one of his projects. So, you know, we think the language would need to have some element of reusable components. Uh, and of course, there is performance. Uh, imagine a smooth running, uh, high definition, uh, sm uh -huh. high frame rate video. Uh, and um, watching it, you'll be taken out of your chair into the middle of the action. You would get into that famous state of flow. And uh, then imagine the video starts stuttering, the frame rate drops. You'd be yanked out of the state right away, right? So architects, when they're working, they really want to stay in that flow state all the time, right? The, Mr. Gaudi does not want to take a break and go for a walk whenever he changes a parameter on his model. Not that walks are not great. They're really good for you. You should all take them. Uh, but uh, anyway, the architects, and Mr. Gaudi specifically, want their models to be really responsive. Uh, CPUs are amazingly fast these days, and uh, GPUs are enormously powerful. Right? But it turns out that even by today's standards, the um, architectural problems are, are still pretty hefty. As an example, a normal skyscraper project might have 10,000 or even more facade panels just, just for the facade, right? Like a facade. And then um, each one of them is an individual entity that you have model, uh, you model independently, right? So, Hence, the language has to be inherently parallelizable. Uh, what we mean by that is that the user who's using the language does not have to think about um, c concurrency and all that stuff while he's uh, making his program work, right? Um, Mr. Gaudi is not a distributed systems programmer, and he doesn't want to think um, and spend his weekend thinking about the Byzantine fault tolerance or version of civilization protocols. And um, another thing, not really a programming language specific, but uh, more of a development environment requirement. Uh, architects, to repeat ourselves, are a very visual people, and they want the output of their program not, also not to be a text, but to be some graphics, some, some kind of geometry, hopefully in 3D. Uh, and not just the output of a program, but also the debug output, your printouts, if you will should be that. So it should be really, really, just like it's easy to print something out of your uh, script, it should be as easy uh, in our environment to generate the output in 3D. Yeah, so you know, what fits the bill? What's a language paradigm that's visual, componentizable, reusable, uh, parallelizable? Um, you know, we thought long and hard about this when we started um, designing this language, and uh, we actually came to the conclusion that um, flow-based programming is actually a pretty good choice. <clears throat> so um, flow-based programming, for those of you who are not familiar with it, um, in flow-based programming, an application is designed as a, or it's represented as a directed graph. So each node in the graph 
is a unit of computation. You can think of it as like a little black box. It's actually a literal black box here. Um, and then the edges in the graph represent data flowing between those um, units of logic. Um, a block can be really simple. It can be a primitive that just you know, adds two numbers, or it can be something complex, um, like a complete graphics kernel. Um, here's one example of a really simple flow uh, that takes two numbers and sums them, and then takes a third number and multiplies the result of the sum by that um, to get nine in this example. Um, and then here's a more com uh, complex example where we take a solid volume and then we just slice it at regular intervals. Um, another thing that's kind of cool about flow-based programming is it's really easy to kind of inspect your application logic and kind of get a, a big picture view of what's going on. So um, people tend to cluster related logic together. So there's like a cluster here in red, a cluster here in green, you know, and a cluster here in blue. Um, so you can get an easy sense of what's going on. Um, and then also something that's really important is parallelization is basically inherent with this model. So you can think of each block as a um, remote process, and then you can think of each edge as an RPC call. Um, so this obviously isn't like the standard way to program computers, but it actually has a pretty long history and a pretty loyal following. So people started experimenting with um, flow-based programming in the mid-60s, and architecture, uh, particularly generative building design, is kind of part of that loyal following. Um, if you go into an architecture firm, it's much more typical to find people who are um, proficient with graphical programming than like uh, writing scripts like Python or C Sharp or anything like that. Uh, now we're going to talk a little bit about our approach to designing Flux. Yeah. Um, so when we started out, we identified kind of four principles that guided our development. So the first principle was we wanted the language to be visually clean. So there's nothing in the way, um, just the necessary blocks and connections. All the blocks have the same kind of equal visual weight. And we found that this kind of reduces noise and mental overhead and allows you to kind of understand what's going on um, more easily. Also, you notice there's no, like, proliferation of buttons and toolbars in um, architectural software like AutoCAD and Revit. This is a really bad problem. Like you get these toolbars that it's like button bonanza. They have like 60 buttons on them and it's just uh, not the nicest. Right, and uh, second of all, we wanted the environment uh, to be uh, modern and seamlessly collaborative. Uh, there may be hundreds of people collaborating on a large building design nowadays, and believe me or not, but the current state of art is FedExing each other flash drives. So we decided to improve on that a little bit. Uh, the other point is uh, we wanted to spare our users hours of arguing with the IT guys. So instead, we run the entire front end uh, in a browser without any installation needed, and the back end is running on our clusters of powerful servers. Yeah. And um, and then our third principle was this idea of smart abstraction. So we didn't want to build a language that was too low level. Um, you know, smart abstractions kind of allow users to get started uh, solving their problems very quickly and easily. Um, so with Flux, we uh, built a standard library that people can use, and it you know has um, operations related to you know mathematical operations and flow control and graphics, and you know it's a very carefully curated set that we um, you know we're curating for kind of completeness and orthogonality. Uh, and it's extensible. When the standard library doesn't cut it, uh, users can um, implement new blocks or modify old blocks using JavaScript. Yeah. Um, so once we had our guiding principles, we started actually building um, the language and the authoring environment. So this is a picture of the authoring environment, our flow-based authoring environment. Um, if you kind of squint, it looks like a cross between a spreadsheet and an infinite canvas. Um, the horizontal rows are called streams, and they're meant to um, help a user kind of organize their logic at a macro level. So in graphical programming, like the rat's nest is a really common problem. Like, imagine this is your program, no fun. Talk about spaghetti code. Yeah, like literally looks like spaghetti. Like I'm kind of hungry looking at it. Um, so that's why we introduced this idea of streams to help people organize their, their logic. Um, so just a quick example, if you had um, a project, you could have a stream that was had one um, 
stream about structural design and one about building your building facade and one about energy analysis. So, you know, a lot nicer than that big old rat's nest that we just saw. Um, Okay, so now we're going to talk a little bit about the um, technology or the architecture that is behind this. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the front end, and then I'll turn it over to Max, and he's going to talk about the back end. So, um, yeah, as you can see, um, this is a pretty complicated front end. And so when we started building it back in 2014, we evaluated Angular and React and Polymer, and um, ultimately ended up going with Polymer, which is Google's web component polyfill library. Um, we were really drawn to the idea of web components because you know, they're modular and reusable and composable. Um, and the idea of Shadow DOM like, really piqued my interest. Like The fact that you can have encapsulated CSS and JavaScript and um, HTML, and it doesn't leak all over your document, um, was really intriguing. Um, you know, in retrospect, one takeaway I have is I wish we would have looked or thought a little bit more carefully about one of Polymer's mantras. The mantra is everything is an element, and like, I mean everything. So even our non visual components like um, data models or the element that we use to track, you know, user actions and, you know, get metrics from it, these are all elements. And so this led to just like massive DOM bloat. Um, for small flows, this wasn't a problem, but for anything kind of um, substantial, we would have like over 20,000, 30,000 DOM nodes, and it just led to um, pretty bad performance problems. So for, as an example, just this one component, this one block that takes in two numbers and adds them is had on the order of like 40 DOM nodes. Um, and a flow like this that's fairly complicated, this would take like an embarrassingly long time to load, like over a minute. Um, and this, uh, when we realized DOM bloat was such a performance problem, we, it caused us to kind of back off on our use of Polymer and um, move towards just like more vanilla JavaScript. So the main thing we did was um, take everything that was non-visual and then we um, converted them into pure JavaScript components. And then we did this kind of ugly but uh, this hack where we um, hacked re require JS to work with HTML imports, and these are like apples and oranges. So it wasn't pretty, but it did work, <laughs> thankfully, and it helped with some of our performance problems. Um, my other big takeaway was, um, you know, sometimes it's not a, a bad idea to like choose boring technology. Like, uh, I love this article by Dan McKinley. If you guys haven't read it, like, I, I highly recommend it. Um, you know, my natural tendency is to like use the bleeding edge thing or like the most shiny thing. Um, and that often is not a good idea if you're trying to ship a product. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Max now and he's going to talk about the back end. Right. So the back end of Flux is a distributed system written in Go and C. Uh, you can think of it as kind of like a compiler and a distributed virtual machine at the same time. The most important components are the flow execution engine over here, the big blue one, uh, then uh, the value store on the side, the code store uh, under it, and the block worker pool over here. So what happens when the program uh, comes into the system is it's analyzed by the flow execution engine. Um, it basically compiles it in, of like, in a internal representation. Then uh, it figures out which blocks have stale state and schedules the concrete block execution on the concrete block workers out of the pool. Uh, the pool is kind of large. We run it on a bunch of servers, and uh, there is a block worker, uh, like block worker pool on each server. And uh, those are pretty simple servers themselves. They're written in Go, and it, uh, internally they contain the V8, the uh, JavaScript um, virtual engine, uh, virtual machine uh, built by Google for the Chrome browser and later open sourced. Uh, so um, the, the blocks are on uh, the block workers again, and uh, they read the uh, inputs uh, from the value store, and they write the outputs to the value store too. Uh, the code store contains the, um, the entire program code and the individual block code. Uh, an interesting abstraction we implemented while working on this uh, is something we call the remote pointers. Uh, those are act uh, kind of like the C++ or C pointers you know and like, but with a twist uh, that the values themselves can be on a remote machine, not even memory, but also on disk. Uh, whenever you dereference a pointer like that, uh, it might invoke uh, a network fetch operation. 
the reason we did this was to uh, scale Flow Execution Engine to way larger programs and to way larger number of programs than it can run concurrently. The entire system is very concurrent. Um, and uh, the benefit of it was always that, also that we could uh, get some of the performance back uh, because some of the outputs of the blocks can be very large and uh, being smart about where we keep them instead of fetching them all over uh, the system uh, brought a lot of improvement. Uh, we also had our fair share of learnings while building the system. One of them, the big one, was uh, that uh, when you're building a tightly connected distributed system, your serialization and RPC overhead starts to matter a lot. So we got a lot of benefit from switching from JSON over HTTP to a more uh, modern and more performant uh, stack of uh, ser serialization and uh, RPC libraries. Uh, right? Yeah. Cool. So you might be wondering, like, why did we build all of this? Well, to bring architecture models into Minecraft, obviously. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but, uh, you know, cool. Um, for real, though, there is actually a very, like, real world scale problem here. Um, you know, the urban population is growing, um, cities are becoming more dense, the land in cities is becoming more scarce and more expensive. You know, I was reading this um, um, article from the UN Population Division, and it was saying that the, it predicted that the urban population is going to grow by an additional 3.3 billion people um, by 2050, which is roughly double what our current urban population is today. Not the world population, but the urban population. So um, if you do the math on this, if we want to house 3.3 billion people, we can compute how many buildings we need to build. So if we assume that we can house 250 people per building, it means that in the next 34 years, we need to build 13.2 million buildings, which is like, that's a lot of buildings. Um, and if you take it one step further, um, we can compute how many buildings we need to build each day, every day for the next 34 years, and we get this kind of mind-blowing number of 1,063. So every day, we need to be building 1,000 buildings. Um, and our current uh, building process, pr processes and practices are just um, too slow and too, um, you know, resource intensive for us to keep up. Right, and it is staggering scale like that. Think about uh, the improvements that are even a minor optimization in the use of materials can bring, like how much mortar or bricks can you save with that, right? Uh, or even after a building has been built, uh, a minor adjustment in a direction it faces uh, can result in uh, tens of a percent of like uh, energy savings um, for, for that building. Uh, imagine that doing happening at a scale. Right now, those optimizations are only possible for the largest projects. We want to scale them to everyone. Yeah. So I mean, these are like massive problems. It's kind of a lot of gloom and doom. But um, you know, at our core, like we are optimists, and we think that even though these problems are hard, they can be solved. Um, you know, computers and technology is already helping people you know, helping humanity do things like cure cancer and mine asteroids. And so we think it's time for, you know, building design to kind of lend itself to the optimizations that are there to be had. And then, you know, beyond that, we basically want to empower the modern Gaudis, kind of the architects of today, to kind of explore the deepest reaches of their imagination. So um, that's it. Thank you so much for coming to our talk. I think we have a few minutes for questions. Thank you. In the back? Yeah. Yeah, so this one, um, this is just, uh, I'd, I'd call it a prototype right now. So um, we, we built part of our platform, we have an SDK. So I built, we built this using our SDK and built the genetic algorithm kind of on top of that. Um, but uh, actually, genetic algorithms, they seem to really capture the imagination of the architecture industry and um, of all sorts of kind of generative algorithms. You know, genetic algorithms seem to be like one of the favorites, so I expect us to build it in at some point. And the second part of my question is, what's the fitness function? Oh yeah, fitness function's pretty, pretty, um, 
it's all based on the golden ratio. So uh, it's a pretty simple fitness function. It takes the um, floor plate wings, so like the, the X and the Y, and it tries to optimize for the golden ratio. And then it takes the um, height of the bell towers and the main tower and tries to get to the, op the golden ratio. Um, if I were to extend it and make it better, I would also add in kind of a kind of material cost. So if like, you know, it's, if you want to build super tall towers, it's going to affect the fitness function in a negative way as opposed to shorter towers. And actually, we consulted uh, an engineer who works with, who worked on projects like that before, and uh, golden ratio was the first thing that came out of his mouth. So that's actually how architects do this. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, to be honest, we built this during a hackathon, so no, we have not thought about it, but yeah. But overall, uh, absolutely, if you can formalize an actual function, like in a, if, if it's like uh, smooth over, over the surface of the optimization and whatnot, you, you can absolutely do analytic optimization on it or like numerical optimization. And back in the purple. So the That's question a good was question. the oh. question was whether directed graphs some particular shapes and we find patterns in how people build those uh, programs. Yeah, um, not too much. I mean, the thing that you tend to see is people really do like cluster their logic that have to do with a certain topic. So you just you'll see clusters, but like the shape of those clusters um, haven't seen a ton of. Um, um, commonality between them. I, I feel like it's very uh, user dependent. Like think about coders when they write their code, they have yeah. their own uh, idiosyncrasies about how they structure the code. Same here, people have an idea of how it should look like and they follow that idea usually. So your question is, um, could we provide like a set of tools to help people like organize them? Oh no, we hadn't thought about that. That's a cool idea. Right. Neat. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> the question is whether we do have a Minecraft interface. Funnily enough, yes. It was built <laughs> during the same hackathon. I don't think it's published yet, but there is an engineer who's really, really excited about it, and he doesn't want to let it go. It's, it's being worked on. Yeah, but it's, it's kind of a cool thought. You could yeah. like take a real building model that you have in like AutoCAD or Revit or one of these like real design tools, and like boom, you've got it in Minecraft. Or certainly the other way. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, right. Do you know, <laughs> yeah, anyway. I was thinking well, of the Legoland in, uh, in Denmark. Right. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. Last one. The question is whether we have uh, an ability to produce other models outside of architecture. Um, so I guess what... Yeah, it's a kind of a complicated question. Um, so part of our platform, we have a set of um, basically, um, you can think of Flux as like this central hub, and then we have a bunch of plugins for other pieces of software that translate your model that's um, expressed in Flux to, um, you know, however a model needs to be expressed in, say, like AutoCAD or Grasshopper. So um, these are all built, we have um, two SDKs and all of our plugins are built with that and they're open source. So somebody, if they wanted to um, take a model that was in Flux and then express it in some other program, they could build their own, basically build their own translator. Um, I'm not sure if that answers your question. All right, we're told to finish up here. So uh, we'll just hang around outside if, for you guys if any, anyone has uh, any other questions. Thank you again for coming. Thanks for the questions. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks.